for the uh, uh, BFA and now makes her home in New York City. BK, I understand? Yes. Brooklyn in the house. Uh huh. <laughs> Uh, she is a fine artist whose work has been shown in galleries. Uh, she's done uh, poster art. She is a musician, too, by the way. I'm going to try to bring that yes. into the conversation. She <laughs> plays bass and uh, started doing uh, posters for her band, and that kind of spun off into a whole other industry for her. She's done posters for, uh, for friends and for local bands uh, there in New York, also for, uh, for musicians and artists like uh, Beck and PJ Harvey. Uh, she's an illustrator who has worked for people like uh, DC Comics, Kid Robot, uh, Warner Brothers, Harper Collins, Spin, Nike, on and on and on. She's awesome. Uh, she's got two uh, books collecting her art, uh, Lonely Heart three. and Lost Constellation. Three. Three, yeah. The newest ones came out uh, last year. Okay. Bunny in the Moon. Okay, all right. Trilogy. Okay. Epic trilogy is complete <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, I own Lonely Heart, and it's wonderful. So if you can find a copy of it somewhere, I'm sure it's out of print at this point, though. No, uh, I think it's in its... Fifth or sixth printing now. Oh no! Which is okay. awesome. Okay, yeah. Dark Very Horse awesome. is keeping it in print, which is super rad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and in 2011, uh, she started her own art boutique, Cotton Candy Machine. Yes. There in New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can find her online at taramcpherson.com, or you can find her on the main stage here at Spectrum as one of our special guests. And uh, we welcome her. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess I just want to start with asking about uh, events like this. Uh, I'm sure you've done lots of shows and lots of conventions over your career. How important is it for you as an artist uh, to interact with fans and to just kind of be the visible face of, you know, your work and also your brand? Um, I don't know. I think it's really important to come meet the people that, you know, collect my work and, and um you know, and follow it, and I know a lot of people have questions, so it's, you know, it's nice to engage in that conversation. Um, and ones like this, where it's not like San Diego Comic-Con, where it's like a total nightmare, um, are a little <laughs> more fun for me, because, you know, it's, there's a little more time, it's less rushed, um, we can have a five minute, ten minute conversation, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes. And, I, yeah, that's, it, it's really important to me to engage with my audience and you know and learn about them as well when you do events do you get uh, approached by young artists who are saying hey i want to do what you do i want to be you know kind of where you are and yeah for sure and what Definitely. what kind of what kind of like, advice what do, do i do yeah, yeah what's, what the, like, yeah, what's the key yeah <laughs> <laughs> um you know i always try and be encouraging and i mean mainly it, well m my answer to it is that it's a a mixture of three things it's the talent that you have. It's the hard work, because you have to bust ass. And then it's um, part luck, you know? Being at the right place at the right time, putting yourself in an environment in a situation where um, opportunities can present themselves to you. You know, if you want to work with bands, then you should be going to shows a lot and meeting, um, meeting the bands, meeting the management. If you want to show in galleries, it's important to go to the openings and meet meet the artists, meet the collectors, meet the gallery owners and the people that work in it. So, you know, whatever you're interested in to really, you know, um, just immerse yourself in that as, as much as possible. Um, and if you don't live in a city where that stuff happens, I think it's important to travel to those places, you know, on like business trips to really try and network, which, you know, maybe a lot of you are doing that here that don't live in the area, you know, you know, so that's right on. <laughs> Um, you talking about bands and whatnot. Now, you being a musician yourself, one of the things that I've found is, is there are a lot of visual artists who also play a musical instrument. Yeah, and for I'm wondering, sure. Yeah, so I'm wondering for you, like, did, did the music start at the same time as, as the visual arts, or did it follow um, it? Or? Y you know, actually, kind of. Um, I started playing bass when I was about 15, and, um, and, you know, and as a teenager, I was just experimenting with different methods of, of art, different mediums and stuff, so... I guess, yeah, actually they were kind of, you know, concurrent in, in my life growing up. But artwork definitely took the priority. And especially when I was at Art Center, I had, like, no time for a life or anything, you know. I barely got enough sleep. So, you know, playing bass definitely took, you know, a back seat to it. Yeah. But as soon as I graduated, one of the first things that happened was I got to start a band with my friends because um, that was a big priority for me, because I had neglected it for so long, you know, and, and I was like, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> I want to have a life again. <laughs> Hobbies. 
The, uh, I read an interview, an old interview that you gave, and you said, and I don't know if you still, still, still feel this way now, but you said you really enjoyed school. You felt like you were really suited yes. for it. Yeah, for uh, me. You know, I work really well in a structured environment. Not a lot of people do. You know, there's some people that, like, school is, like, you know, not for them. But I, I love the deadlines. I won't get anything done if I don't have a deadline. That's why I don't take commissions because, like, four years later, I'm like, Crap, I still have to do that. Here you go. For the, that guy. You know, so I've learned, you know, and that guy got his painting, so don't worry. <laughs> but after that, I was like, I just can't take any more commissions on because it just, I don't want to put myself in the situation to let someone else down when I know that, you know, when I, when I get like, I have solo shows lined up and I have like, you know, X amount of jobs lined up and the commission will always take the back seat, so. Mm -hmm. So I just I try and actually incorporate it into my art shows. Like there's this one collector that I have that wanted a commission. I said, well, well I can't do the commission directly for you, but I'll include I'll do the painting that that you want. You know, just a real loose um, suggestion of of what he wanted, and I'll put it in my next solo show, and the painting will be reserved for him to have first pick at it. And then if he you know something happens whatever and he doesn't take it, it's still in my show. It'll still be um, you know visually um you know it'll still be in the same theme as what i'm working with right now and it'll fit so okay um to talking about your work um there's a poster that you did for beck mm -hmm. um and i know that you actually use the same image for uh for your for your parents at dragon con you kind of you know and i'm wondering oh yeah yeah do you now do you get a chance to do that often obviously you work out in terms of uh, your agreement with whomever you're doing the work for to be able to re repurpose it for something else? Yeah, always, mm -hmm. always, always make sure to own your art. Never, I mean, very occasionally there's a situation where I do like a full buyout, um, but that's so rare, you mm -hmm. know, and, and it has to be for a good amount of, of money mm -hmm. for me to never be able to use that art again. But I always own all my art. So if I want to use it again for something later, then it's fine. And, and the situation is with... Um, you know, with certain like advertising illustration jobs, is they they pay for usage. So it's like a one year usage, two year usage, of uh, like worldwide rights on print, web, um, you know, and whatever um, thing would be invented in in that time is is usually specified in the contract. And then so after that year or two years, then I can use the artwork for what I want. Um, there's actually the there's an original painting on my in my booth on the table that was for this ad campaign for Mira in Europe, and it's a Seeing Eye Dog Foundation. So they have a, a one-year usage for that, and um, with the option for uh, you know a renewal, a second year and a third year. So at the end, so I can't do anything with it. You know, a lot of people are asking if I can make prints of it yet, and I just I can't do it until that usage period is mm -hmm. done. But then after that, it's mine. I can make prints. I can do what I want with it. So that's kind of a normal situation with with advertising. But like with band posters, um, no, that image is mine. I can do whatever I want with it immediately. You know, it's not the greatest idea to do that like right, right, right away right. like oh confused. yeah you did it for this too. <laughs> yeah you know i mean use your own discretion but how uh how quickly did the, the band posters take off for you once you started doing them because uh i was re again reading that same interview uh, you know you said yeah i just started kind of doing it. it seemed like a natural extension i was already a visual artist now already a musician and then all of a sudden I guess people started saying, hey, can you do one for us? And can you do one for me? And mm -hmm. uh, do you enjoy that? Do you still enjoy that sort of thing? Uh, oh, yeah, uh, I love okay. I love making posters still. I just finished one um, yesterday in my hotel room, actually, for Franz Ferdinand. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Which is okay. fun. I just posted it on Instagram, if any of you follow me. Posted it yesterday. <laughs> you can see it there. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people, especially me at first, I knew you as, you know, in terms of your paintings. But uh, you also do uh, vinyl art, do 3D art, uh, huh? a lot of stuff with Kid Robot. Yes. Now, when did that, that part of your career start to develop? And um, That started in 2005 when I moved to New York. Okay. Um, it was funny because I moved to New York and uh, I knew that Kid Robot was there, so I was hoping to get to meet with them. And right as I was moving, I got asked by this uh, girl who was curating a Dunny series, and it was uh, like the... L.A. Dunny series. 
And I was like, well, you know, I, I just moved. From, from, I don't live there anymore. From though. the west to the east. <laughs> and she's like, oh, you know, you grew up there. It's fine. So I think still to this day, people think I, I live in L.A. because of that Dunny still. But I had moved by the time it came out. But that was my first Dunny. And, um, you know, um, in reference to what I was saying before, to kind of immerse yourself in the environment you want to be in, I always wanted to do toys with Kid Robot. And so I moved to New York. Their offices were in New York. I got asked to be in this um, I Love Money show, and it was, you know, the hand-painted um, money thing. So I did my custom, and, you know, I was like, well, let me just go down to the offices and drop it off. You know, I want to go meet the people that I've been emailing with and hopefully right. meet some other people. So I did that, you know, and I dropped it off. And, um, you know, I was handing it over to the, you know, the director that I had been emailing with. And right then, the owner, Paul Budnitz at the time was owner, he walked by and he was like, oh, you're, you're Tara McPherson. And he's like, you know, looked at, looked at my money painting and he's like, oh, I love this. And he's like, do you want to do toys? And I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, Joanna, uh, set up a meeting. Okay, okay, bye. And I was like, yes. <laughs> you know, that, like, that was my ideal situation and, and thank gosh that, you know, it worked out as I had hoped. <laughs> but, you know, if you put yourself in those situations to, to meet the people that you want to work with, you know. Like, like you said earlier. Good things happen, yeah. 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 For, for anybody here who only knows you by your paintings, tell them what a dunny and what a money is, because the first time I heard those terms, I was like, huh, what? A you money? Know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh... um, the dunny is like this rabbit toy that Kid Robot makes, and it's a platform toy. So it was designed by Tristan Eaton, and now a million different artists do their version of it. And then the money came out, and it's like the monkey dunny version so like you know just little cute monkey ears right. <laughs> um i mean who hasn't heard of a dunny and a money right ah. <laughs> only one two okay so a couple people so hopefully that explained it they they make them um blank so you can do your own version and then they have like gosh I don't know. The Dunny series, or they've done so many of them, and it's just a huge variety of artists and even musicians do their designs on them too, Everybody. which is pretty cool. It really spans like a huge range, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and you talked about coming from the West Coast to the East Coast, and I was curious because, and I don't know who said this about you, but they said that they called you the Crown Princess of Poster Art, <laughs> and I'm just curious if you're uh, comfortable like with labels and things like uh, uh, you know lowbrow and pop surrealism and indie and and you know tags like that that people uh -huh. lay on you. Are you comfortable with it? Are you, you just um, kind of go along with the? I actually the like or? most of them. The lowbrow term, I I've never I don't know I don't really like it because. I don't know, just the, the word, like, lowbrow, low. Well, it's like, normally associated you know, with something that's par, not very, sub yeah. quality. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, ideally, like, I want to be shown in museums, you know, and I, I want my art to, you know, hopefully be around for hundreds and hundreds of years, and, and I, I hope to be remembered in some history books. And, you know, I mean, that ideally, that I would love to, to make my mark and... and and so lowbrow, I don't know. I've never really jived with that. I really like the pop surrealism term. Yeah. You know, I think that really suits and fits really closely with, with what, how I'm working. Um, but yeah, all the, all the rest of, of the terms and things that people have said have been good. Yeah. And especially like, you know, if someone says you're the crown princess of poster art, like I'm like, sweet, I can put that on my book. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good quote. <laughs> I'm like, thank you for writing yeah. that. <laughs> Uh, since you do so much and you have so many varied interests, uh, who are some of the uh, the artists that inspired you when you were a kid? I know that that's kind of a general question, but yeah. I mean, you know, people are always wondering what you know what got you to mm -hmm. this point. So. Um, well, I really love Japanese art. Well, uh, I'll start by saying um, I used to work in this coffee shop at Borders, and I got fired <laughs> for giving away coffee. Um, but fortuitously, I had a friend that worked at this um, Japanese animation store. And she's like, oh, don't worry about it. Just, just come work with us. We need someone else right now. And I was like, really? Awesome. And so they hired me. And uh, hi. <laughs> and I, you know, just got introduced to this whole new world of, of Japanese art that I really wasn't familiar with. And um, so I ended up managing the store. And I was the wholesaler. You know, I bought and sold the toys and, and ran the retail store. 
And that also gives me like direct experience with like the merchandising that I've done with myself, you know, like at conventions like this. And then now with the cotton candy machine, having the store, you know, mm -hmm. um, and Sean, who had just ran up, he, he runs the store. We own cotton candy machine together. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just, I got introduced to this character based art world that, you know, I was like, I want to do that. You know, we we sold art toys and video games and animation and like merchandise, like playing cards and wall scrolls and all kinds of different stuff. And that really made me think like, I, I really want to do this. You know, mm -hmm. like I, I really like this style. Um, and also I, I really like old Japanese ukiyo-e woodblock printing. Um, I've always loved the, the flatness of it. And then conversely, I really love um, the Renaissance, like mannerist and romantic paintings that are really highly rendered and detailed with oil paint. Um, Bronzino, um, Botticelli, I really love. Um, Egon Schiele, Gustav Yay! Klimt, <laughs> um, Toulouse Lautrec, um, Ong. That. A lot of the old masters, you know, I love. Um, and especially with, with traveling through Europe, you know, my priorities, when I get to a new city, it's like go to the museum that's there because ah, they just okay. hold, like, uh, amazing, just all, like, the classic beautiful paintings. Um, so mainly with my work, that play between the, the flat and the rendered is something that really interests me. And to find that, that balance, you know, and, if if the whole painting is rendered, I kind of want to like pull my hair out because it takes, it's, you know, a lot of dedication and a lot of work and effort, um, w which I love. But I also I like the visual play between having a a nice open flat area with the rendered part. Um, to me, it gives it more of a balance. You know. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, is there any comics, animation, any of that nerdy stuff uh, there that informs your work as well? Or oh yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I used to read, I guess, mainly like Vertigo and indie comics when I was collecting mm -hmm. um, and reading them. I still read comics. Actually, I don't read that much now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you too, huh? <laughs> I think that's kind of the syndrome with with everybody and with like yeah the industry. But um, no, I mean, I still I like reading the graphic novels. I've just gotten so busy, mm -hmm. you know, that it's it's hard to find time to sit down with a the, with the good book. And you did um, some work for DC at Vertigo, right? Yes, yeah, and then I started doing covers for Vertigo. Um, mm -hmm. Around the time that I had started doing posters, I guess I'd been doing posters for like a year or so, and then I got contacted by one of the editors at Vertigo um, who wanted to see a press kit from me. Mm -hmm. And she emailed me, you know, it was one of those days you check your email and you're like, oh my God, they emailed me, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, press kit. All right, the press kit. Like I've never sent a press kit. Got to figure out what a press kit is. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what a press kit was because I um, was an assistant for this um, manager of actors and stuff, and I used to have to prepare press kits. Mm -hmm. She actually managed David Duchovny, so I would make David Duchovny's press kits. So I knew what it was. Um, so I was like, okay, let me put it together. You know, the, in the way that I knew how, just print right my resume put a little business card in the little slot in the folder. Um, and I just started making merchandise and stuff then. So, you know, I put a bookmark and some art prints of mine and um, stickers. And I think I was making snow globes at the time. And, like, I put a snow globe in the box with it. And I just, like, put in, like, <laughs> everything that I could that I had. And I was like, all right. <laughs> and... Um, and yeah, and she got it, and she was like, that's the best press kit I've ever gotten. Oh, and I was wow. like, oh, wow, <laughs> holy shit. Okay, good. <laughs> I did good then. Yeah. The, um, didn't you work on a graphic novel uh, donor? Um, no, actually, that I never, f I never finished that. Okay. I ended up canceling sorry to, sorry that. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Bad news. <laughs> I thought you were going to say fables. Yes. <laughs> no, I well, know I about fables, fables, but yeah. <laughs> but I was curious about the, because I figured it was your yeah. own story, so, you know. Yeah, well, after Fables, I, I had done Fables, um, like a 12-page um, mini or mini story in the anthology, A Thousand and One Nights of Snowfall. And they asked me to, if I wanted to do a full graphic novel. 
and you know being presented with that opportunity was amazing you know and I, I really didn't think it through fully so I, I said yes right away and so the writer was working on a loose draft of the story and he had like the first you know whatever like 15 pages written and I started working on the character designs and I and I I think I'd done like six pages or so and for me personally it's very difficult I admire comic artists so much ah, there we and go. animation <laughs> artists. It's just too repetitive for me. I started to get bored and it just wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. And I was like working on these pages and, you know, I was painting them all. So it wasn't just like sketching them out and giving them to an inker. You know, I had to sketch it. I had to draw it. I had to ink it and then I had to paint it. You know, and it, it took a lot like of work too. On top of that, three so. days yeah. for yeah. each page, at least. And I just, I was going crazy with it, okay. you know. And I really had to ask myself a, a, a big question, and you know, do I want to do this? I know I could do it, but was I going to be happy doing it? And you know, yeah, it, it was hard to face that, but I, I, I had to pull out of the project and okay. and just tell them, like, you know, I. I don't think this is for me. I really, I love doing covers. I love that one central image, mm -hmm. but to do the, the full, you know, hundred and something pages, I just, I think I was going to be depressed. <laughs> if, <laughs> like, if anybody hadn't seen her Fables covers, definitely check them out. They're awesome. <laughs> um, now I got this next thing from Wikipedia, so it's, it's questionable as to whether or not it's accurate at all. But did you do some interning or some work with uh, Matt Groening on Futurama? Yes. Okay, now how did that how did that come about? Um, when so I was in art school, and normally you'd take a break uh, halfway through and do an internship. So I had a friend of the family knew uh, one of the producers that worked on Futurama. Okay, and it was at Rough Draft Studios. It was in Burbank, and so she, you know, set up an introduction. And I went down and, and met with them, and and they needed someone to help out. Um, basically, I was a PA, you know. Personal assistant. A production assistant. Production assistant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, I didn't have to go pick up dry cleaning or anything, okay. but, but I did e about everything else for, you know. <laughs> um, but I learned so much there, and I had such a great time that I ended up taking two terms off of school I instead of the one. And so I was there for about eight months, and I worked on the end of season two and the beginning of season three. And, you know, I, I would scan the drawings uh, to help with the animatics, I make Xeroxes, um, copy a lot of the drawing pages, and mm -hmm. they have like multiple, multiple copies of them. Um, put together the books. I helped with the color keys, um, where like they'd have the color layout, and I'd have to like match the, um, pick the color for like, oh, the wall is this color, and then you know his shirt is this color, and, um, and I just learned so much. Mm -hmm there it was fantastic and amazing such a wonderful experience and I really utilize um, a lot of what I learned in my art now and, and kind of how I approach things and and it um, is also really helpful with like character designs mm -hmm. to learn how, how the character designers there worked and how it kind of directly relates to like doing toys like doing turnarounds you know you need the front side back top bottom three-quarter view that's what all the character designers would have to do, and, and to learn how to draw that one character in another in another angle, you know, which you don't normally do as an illustrator. You know, you you make your illustration, and then that's it. But it's like, wait, what is what does he look like from behind? Um, so that was something that really directly helped me. Okay. Yeah. Now, have have you considered at all uh, animating any of your, uh, your 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 IPs or your stories? Maybe Orion, yeah. uh, and have yeah. you been approached or? Yes. Okay, and so um, that's yeah. Is there an announcement that, that we can have here? I not mean. <laughs> officially, no official announcement, but maybe, maybe okay. <laughs> in the future. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have any questions from you guys? No. Hello. Hi, Tara. Big fan. Um, big longtime fan. But I was really curious. Um, I know your startings were all very. Um, girl power and forward and just talking about in your mm -hmm. artwork and in your books about love and hate and all of those things. How has being a mom 
now changed mm -hmm. your uh, direction with your art, or has it changed it? I don't know. I think it's it's so new. I have a 10-month-old son, for those of you that don't know, and um, I, I, it's still so new. I just started working, like, a month ago, so... Um, I don't know. I think I'm still internalizing it all, you know. Um, I imagine that it would be really neat to do, like, a, a fun children's book. I've always wanted to do one, so, you know, maybe in the next few years that might be something interesting to do. Um, but, yeah, I'm still processing it all. So so we'll see. You know, maybe I'll, I'll do some more, you know, children characters in my work or maybe some more whimsical stuff. Um, but I think for my... For my art shows, actually, the m even more dramatic thing that just happened to me is my apartment burned down in January. Oh, no. And <laughs> it was fucked up. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that might really affect my... I'm, I'm starting work on a solo show right now. And so I'm kind of just in the research phase and figuring stuff out and what I want to do and... Um, just amassing images and looking through my image archives for, I always take reference photos when I travel of like anything and everything, like, oh, the pattern on the floor looks cool, like click, you know, so I'm going through years of stuff. And I do that with each show too, to pull like, oh, what might, you know, oh, I kind of want to paint that, maybe that'll work this time. Um, so the, the fire thing, I'm kind of like, you know, I think that might be a neat aspect to put into the show. Some way. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. I have a question about like social media. Can you talk a little oh. bit about how social media, how you use it to raise awareness of and promote your work and goods uh -huh. and good things and bad things about it? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I've always been pretty up on trying to be on, you know, when it was Friendster, when it was MySpace, now with Facebook, now with Instagram and Twitter and, and whatnot, and um, having a presence there. Um, and I love being able to share my work, you know, and the process with people, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's important. I've never really been a good blogger, I kind of really suck at my blog, like on my website, I, I haven't made an entry in, in forever. So using social medias, it's just quicker, it's more efficient, it's easier for me, and, and it's more immediate than having to sit down and spend four hours writing a blog. I'm like, ah, oh. <laughs> I'll just post it up on Instagram, and then it goes to everything. Um, so, yeah, yeah, and, and, it's, and it's fun, and, and, you know, and there's still a, um, a format, a platform for people to ask questions, and, you know, I, I try to get to them and, and you know, reply. Hopefully they answered it. <laughs> Hi, Tara. Hi. Hi. You obviously have a very unique art style that's specific to you. And I was wondering, at what point in your life as an artist did you realize that's the style you want to stick with? Um, well, I would say, well, I have a good story for this, this question. Um, when I was in art school, I really was all over the place um, and really didn't have a style um, there were these scholarship competitions every, well, not a competition, but it was like, yeah, based on your rating, you you get like X amount of money. Um, and so every term I would apply, and I was always like way low, like not even on the radar. <laughs> I'm like, shit. Like, I thought my work was getting good, you know, this, <laughs> this sucks. Um, but yeah, I, I was experimenting. I was all over the place. And then there were these, you know, other artists in in my term and and stuff that had like you know this is my style this is what I'm doing and they had like it supposedly figured out then you know and they'd they'd always rank really high you know also maybe they were older maybe they had you know had a little more experience going into college than I had um, but I I didn't force the style and I I didn't say like I'm gonna draw this way. Um, and so with, with that experimentation and figuring it out, I think finally towards the end, um, we had eight terms in my college, so around like the seventh term, it really started to click and kind of make sense for me. And I think that's when my style, you know, started 
happening, but it was it was a very natural evolution and a natural progression without me consciously thinking like, oh, I'm going to draw eyes this way. You know, it just was, you know, I think I would just draw an eye and somehow they kind of looked a certain way and, and, and fit together, you know, throughout all my drawings and, and all my paintings and all my pieces. Um, and it's interesting to me because those like, couple artists that I can think of that I went to school with that were like, you know, amazing. Everybody was jealous of their style and whatnot. They don't even work like that anymore. Like they, maybe they like, I don't know, started and did it that too early. And, and now that's like 180. Like if you see their current work, it looks nothing like what it did in school. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, maybe, you know, and that was their path and, and that's great too. But for me, I, I feel like I had a more natural kind of evolution with it. So, you know, and, and I've taught it at Parsons as well. And I was trying to tell my students that, like, use this time to experiment. Don't worry. Don't feel pressured to have this, like, perfect portfolio yet. Really experiment, you know, and if it sucks and whatever, you know, start on something new and, and try something else. Eventually, it will all kind of gel together and form together. Hi, Tara. Hello. Um, you were featured on a um, documentary called American Artifacts uh, about um, yeah. screen printing. Uh -huh. And I saw that, and um, that's what I knew you for. Like, I didn't know that you did paintings or anything like that. Um, and I'm curious, um, with screen printing, and you obviously have a very do-it-yourself spirit, um, have you ever considered doing digital? Because I know that's the, uh, that's the uh, constant back and forth, you know, uh, people just as everything's featured here, there's a lot of, um, you know, traditional, but yet a lot of digital, you know, digital creeping into paintings. the workflow. Uh -huh. have, have you ever thought of embracing that or do you strictly want to keep it traditional? Well, I, I use Photoshop for my posters. Um, I scan in the drawing and, um, but then I, I assemble the art in Photoshop. Like I'll scan in, um, sometimes I hand paint the type, so I'll scan that and then I place it in, in Photoshop. Um, or I like finding, there's like these really cool old type typography books that have like a full, you know, um, font Alphabet. collection. Yeah. Um, scan that in and then, you know, I just select each letter and hand place it. That's what I did if you look at the Franz Ferdinand poster. I, I scanned each, each letter and, you know, placed that by hand. And then there's this filigree work that I scanned from a different book that was like old Victorian kind of ornament stuff. And then I kind of place those together to make like this kind of cool, you know, Franz Ferdinand font type thing. And, um, and then I, I do the coloring in Photoshop as well, but th they do get screen printed afterwards. It's kind of like a placeholder, like here's where all the pink is gonna go, you know, and I fill that area. And so when the file gets to the printer, um, they output the films, which are all like basically, basically black ink on um, acetate, you know? And so when the, um, the light shine, shines through onto the um, photo emulsion, that'll like, that's the part where the ink will go through. And um, so I kind of look at it as like a placeholder for when it will get screen printed. Um, but yeah, I, and I guess with toys, they like the toy designs in Illustrator, which I really suck at Illustrator. I'm not <laughs> very good at it at all. Um, so I try to just kind of hand draw them and color them in Photoshop. But yeah, I, I do use the computer as a tool, but I don't think I'll be, I don't think I'll ever start doing paintings in Photoshop or, or anything like that. That's not, I'd rather just paint it for real. Cause then you have something to show, you have something, an original to sell afterwards, you know, you can make double the money you know, if you get an illustration job and you say you get paid $5,000 to do the the piece, you know, if you do it digitally, you can sell prints afterwards, um, of course. But, you know, if I paint it, I can sell the painting for another $5,000 and make prints and make from prints, it. Yeah. yeah, as well. Hi. Hi. Oh, I think it's off. Oh, hi. Is that there you go. Do you ever get approached to do work that's not necessarily in the style that you're... I lost the end of the question. In a style. 
Uh oh. Techni technical difficulties. And, and how do you deal with that? Um, that doesn't normally happen, but but recently, well, like a few years ago, I got approached by Penguin Books to do. They were working on this tattoo series, um, and they were re-releasing uh, their top-selling and classic titles, and had tattoo artists working on you know redoing the covers. And so they approached me, and they're like, I know, I know you're not a tattoo artist, but you have a lot of tattoos. Do you, do you want to take part in this series? I was like, hmm, okay. But they're like, it has to be in a traditional tattoo art style. Um, you know, and I, so I kind of thought about it. I was like, I don't know, you know, will, will that work? But it could be fun. You know, uh, they asked me to do Bridget Jones' diary. And um, so, yeah, I, I took the job, and... Um, you know, I I tried to work with, I looked at a lot of flash art for reference, you know, like real old stuff um, and newer contemporary tattoo stuff. And, um, you know, and I tried to do some like test projects, whatever, with, um, with watercolors. <laughs> I was like, this is hard. Blending the watercolors is really difficult. I'm not that experienced with watercolors. So I was kind of like, flailing with it. I'm like, ooh, I don't know if this is going to turn out that good. Um, so then I thought, all right, well, how can I achieve this look without using watercolors? You know, what am I good at? I'm really good with oils and acrylics. So I did some test samples with oil paints, and I put um, liquid down, which is this glazing medium, onto paper. And then I just did thin gl transparent glazes to mimic the look of watercolors and I was able to get like smooth perfect gradations and make it look like a watercolor but it was actually oil paint um, and so then I felt more confident with like okay I, I can actually <laughs> get this done and make it look good um, so yeah that, that was my experience with it and, and it was a fun job to, to work on you know and um, and to try something new, but I still think, you know, the character, the girl I drew was, you know, still look like my I'll stuff. I think mic. people would recognize it still. I just had a question. You said that you'd finished a painting in your hotel on this trip. A poster. Uh, uh, like, was yeah. that a Photoshop job or was that a painting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I was finishing the, the type um, and stuff, like, just the last touches on the poster. Okay. Is but I have brought paintings to hotel rooms while I was traveling. The okay, Bridget Jones I was wondering one, about that. I was working on that while I was in Australia. I was doing a, a lecture thing, semi-permanent, in Melbourne and Perth. And I brought the oil paints and the paper, and I was, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> deadlines. Deadlines, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Tara, you mentioned uh, uh, speaking at uh, Parsons. Do you ever get a chance to get back to your uh, alma mater at uh, Art Center and do some speaking, speaking and workshops with the uh, students? I haven't yet, but the um, department chair had asked me to. She said, you know, anytime you're in L.A., let us know. You know, we'd like to have you talk. Okay. I think that would be really fun. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure you're like their champion. They're like, yeah, <laughs> success, a great success story. I hope so. Um, tell us about Cotton Candy Machine and exactly what it is, an art boutique. Uh, why you started it, and what kinds of things that uh, people who visit uh, New York City could could see in your in your in your store? Um, well, the Cotton Candy Machine actually used to be my art studio. Um, when I moved to New York, I I really liked the idea of having a storefront space. Um, one because getting the poster shipments, they're very large and very heavy when I get them from my my printer. You know, huge huge boxes that are like you know, and if. If it's multiple editions at the same time, you know, it's hundreds of pounds. So going upstairs is not an option. And, you know, of course, a, a lot of places have elevators, but a lot of places don't. I just like the idea of having, having a storefront space and having that ease of access. Um, so I, I found a wonderful spot in Williamsburg in, in Brooklyn, right by where I live. And so that was my art studio for like five and a half years. And I just put vellum up in the windows. I had a couple posters up there when I first moved in, and then people would, like, open the door. They're like, oh, is this your store? Oh. I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Maybe that's not a good idea. People keep coming in and uh, interrupting me. So I took the posters down. I just kept the vellum up in the windows to keep it private, but it let the light in so I could paint. And um, then Sean and I were talking, and you know, about kind of – making that next step he used to work with alex pardee at, with zero friends yeah doing pop-up stores with them 
um, all around the country. And, um, and he's like, what about we, you know, start something in this space? Like, it's a storefront. It was kind of like just the next logical, natural step for us to take um, and turn it into, into an art boutique. So I, I moved my art studio, and then we worked on, on um, turning it into a store. And it was April in 2011 that it opened. And, um, yeah, so we sell all of my merch and then all of our, the artists and friends that, that we love as well. And so we have monthly art shows with featuring different artists. Um, sometimes it's a solo show. Sometimes it's six different artists. It just depends on the show. And so with each show we kind of naturally amass more product in the store from the artists that we have worked with so also from like a, a business standpoint it's not like we're having to go buy like tons and tons of product each month for the show um it works more like consignment like so like a gallery yeah. but but we like to think of it as as not as a gallery more of an art boutique because we sell books we sell apparel um, toys, uh, all kinds of little, you know, tchotchkes and, and fun stuff directly related to the artists that we show. Okay. Yeah. Do you have anything that's coming up that you want to announce uh, or anything, you know, I, I know I talked about the animation thing earlier, but is there anything that, uh, that we should look for that we need to be uh, looking out for? Uh, with Cotton Candy Machine? Well, just in general. Uh, with, uh... Um, well, uh, so with Cotton Candy Machine, we just started, um, there's the the Roebling side of the building. We just started um, like an art wall there. So there's three big art panels. It's uh, Buff Monster, David M. Cook, and Lamar Supreme, who does stuff with Mishka. Um, and that'll be rotating. So that's a new fun thing. Um, the current show right now in Cotton Candy Machine is Daniel Danger, who's phenomenal. If you haven't seen his work, okay. look it up. It's super cool. Um, and next month we have Tiny Trifecta, which is the our annual group show that I curate. And it's um, each artist does three tiny pieces, and every piece of art is one hundred dollars. But you have to be there in person. The stuff that doesn't sell at the opening goes online afterwards, so you can get it online. But if if you want first dibs, it's it's first come first serve in person. Um, and then lots of other fun shows. And then for me. Um, I'm just starting work on my next solo show. It's going to be a Jonathan Levine Gallery in New York yeah. um, this October, mm -hmm. um, which ideally I would have started in February, but my house burned down. So it's a little delayed, but, sure. you know, <laughs> sure. I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> like I said, deadlines, you know, I work well with deadlines. So <laughs> yeah. I'll make it work. Hi, uh, can you sort of talk about your experiences transitioning from school to uh, having a career and sort mm -hmm. of navigating the business side of being an illustrator and an artist? Yeah. Um, so when I graduated, I had kind of started getting some freelance jobs here and there. Art Center had like um, a job board or whatever that you could check um, where, you know, if people wanted uh, student, you know, re recent graduates to, to do their work. Um, and so I got a few jobs from there and um, had, I guess, just kind of started doing posters like the first year after I graduated. But it was hard, you know. I mean, I, I had this, this drive and this ambition and I knew where I wanted to go. Um, but, you know, not, not a lot of opportunities. So, you know, I mean, like, I, I would go to all the art shows. I, I showed in a lot of group shows at that time. That was a, a big thing. And I had so many paintings from, in, you know, from school that, um, that, I, that I thought were really good. So I would show those in the group shows and, and started selling my work and sold most of my paintings. Um, and, you know, I... I would try and meet a lot of the artists as well, like when I went to the gallery shows. I know, like, early on, I, I would talk to... I got a lot of good advice from, like, Gary Baseman and from Kozik. Um, and just kind of, you know, having them help you out. Um, I 
I would contact, I guess I had one regular job after I graduated. I was doing um, photo retouching for like a place that did actors headshots. So like I would scan in the their photograph and like, you know, fix pimples and wrinkles and stuff <laughs> on their faces. <laughs> Which, Can I know, hire you now? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I do good work. Um, but actually, that really helped me with retouching my own paintings now. You know, um, getting like smudges and weird stuff from the scanner and whatnot. Um, so I had that job for about five months, and that was it. That's the only regular job that I've had since I graduated. And at that at that point in that transition i started doing rock posters and i started getting freelance jobs here and there that took most you know took a lot of my time where i found it really difficult to keep working you know the regular job and get what i needed done and so making that jump to you know quitting so i could just do art you know scary and i trust me i was broke <laughs> still very broke but um you know it enabled me to to have the time to really do it fully. Because I think it's really hard when you're working. Uh, also, when I went to school, I, I didn't work. I, I took loans so I wouldn't have to work. Because I figure if you're, you're spending, you know, $45,000 a year on tuition, and then you're spending 50 hours a week at work, like, you're just kind of holding yourself back. Now, I know some people have to, and there's no way around it. But for me, I just felt like I, I want to devote myself fully you know, get my money's worth and not waste my time, you know, at a stupid job when I need to learn how to paint and learn how to draw and learn how to do these things. Um, but uh, also, you know, I started calling around to galleries. Um, one thing that kind of helped me is, you know, as I mentioned before, I started kind of making my own merchandise and, and stuff, things that I wanted to make. And... Um, I had met some of the people that worked at Juxtapose, and they talked me into running like a little quarter page ad in the back of the magazine. And you know, it was 500 bucks a month. And I was like, oh my God, like that's more than my rent. Like, <laughs> can I do this? And, um, you know, but I signed on for a year contract, and I'm so happy that I did. That was one of the, the things that really helped. Um, people get to know my name and recognize my work because every month there was just a little, you know, a little piece of of my work in Juxtapose. People would say like, oh, I saw you in Juxtapose. Now, I'd never been interviewed by Juxtapose or featured or anything. I was paying for an ad, but people didn't, you know, they didn't, know. They, they didn't really think about that. They just thought, oh, I saw you in Juxtapose. So that really worked to my advantage. And so I started selling a lot online, you know, on my web store. I think all those things kind of, kind of helped all, all at the same time. Any more questions? One more question for you, Tara. Yes. In regards to, um, I guess, being an artist with a, a brand or a style that is instantly recognizable, um, how do you keep your brand vibrant, and how do you keep your brand, you know, um, uh, adjusting to the ever-changing? you know, tired of the market, you know, if there is such a thing? That's a good question. You know, honestly, I don't do art for anyone else but myself. And so I, I really try to not pay attention to trends or fashions or whatever is going on. I, I want to get out what my vision is and what's in my head and things that I want to process and and learn about you know like each solo show that I do is like uh, I look at it like it's a thesis you know like I'm getting my masters and I'm in school again and I'm working on this whole thesis project that's going to relate to you know all the individual pieces are going to relate together and and relate to my previous work um, so I really try to to you know, just do what I what I want to do. <laughs> Try and be selfish with it, because I feel like if if I'm true to myself and what I want to say, then you know, it it will follow. the The rest will kind of you know, it'll have its place in the world. <sighs> I hope I explained that well. 
That was perfect. Uh, well, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you all for definitely uh, uh, check Tara out. Her booth is over by the front over there. She's got some great great stuff for you to purchase. Yeah. And uh, we thank her for being our, our special guest on the stage. Thank you for the, the good stage. questions, Thank too. you, Tara.